So um, this morning, it's great to be with you. And when Kalinda and I share the stories and share what's happened to us, we love to share those things. And we love to share the exciting things of what God's been doing in our lives. Is anyone okay with me preaching the word this morning? Yeah? All right. Well, that's good. (laughs) So uh, we love to share the exciting things of what God's been doing in our lives. But let me tell you also, there's some extremely hard things that we walk through, difficult things, challenges that we have to face in, uh, in living where we are. You know, I, uh, I've heard it said somewhere that the only constant in life is change. The only constant in life is change. And that means that wherever we are, whatever we're doing in life, there are always changes happening. No sooner do we get used to one set of circumstances, but we need to learn to uh, adapt and change and grow with a new set of circumstances. And sometimes that can be really uncomfortable, really uncomfortable. So for Kalindra and I, and moving over to, uh, to the place where we are, we started from zero in terms of language. Well, I should say a little bit more than zero. We started with with two words, ni uh, hao and xie xie. That's it. That's it. Other than that, we've lost our ability to communicate. We're like little babies in this place. And so we, we lost, lost that ability to communicate and had to adapt and change. There were other things that, uh, you know, are, are small irritations, small irritations of, where do you buy stuff? Where do you find stuff? And then there's uh, the irritations and inconvenience of things that we take for granted here. I remember the first time I went to change a light bulb, and I thought the light went out. I thought, easy, I can handle that. So uh, up I scrambled on a chair and pulled the, the, uh, uh, the cover off the light, and what greeted me was something foreign and alien that I had no idea what to do with. Wires hanging everywhere, strange things. I think, I'm in trouble. I can't even change a light bulb in this place. <laughs> and that, that might sound small and trivial, and now it is. But uh, at the time, I tell you, that worked me over. Because if you can't change a light bulb, what, what other things can't you do? Basic stuff. That's at a low level. At a higher level, there's a loss and disconnection of relationships and friendships because even though we're still friends and we have family here, we're separated by a long distance. And that's a hard one to take. That's really hard to take. So this morning, I want to encourage you, just from the Word of God, on how do we conquer change Because no one likes change. No one finds change easy. But how do we conquer it? Because every one of us has to live through it. Every one of us deals with it. How do we conquer change? And how do we triumph through it? So this morning, I want to encourage you in that. Because each of us share some of these experiences. You see, there's little changes that are just trivial. And then this is at a whole nother level. Some of us go through times where we lose significant friendships and relationships. And there's a wrench in that. At another level, again, there's the losses that we walk through in life that are not unique to us. It's just common to people everywhere. The loss that comes from living in a broken world. Infertility. Stubborn health problems, miscarriages, deaths of family members. All of these things are losses that at various times each of us will need to walk through. How do we conquer these things and live through them? Because we're called as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, to be more than conquerors. To be more than conquerors. Are there many people? Are there anyone here? Is there anyone here? Who knows our call to be more than a conqueror through life? Come on, give me a shout and let me know that you're awake this morning. All right. So this morning, if you have your Bible with you, 
I want you to turn with you, uh, turn with me in your Bible to Lamentations chapter three. Now, let me give a, a bit of a, a brief here to start with. You see, the book of Lamentations can be hard to read, really hard to read. It was written at a particularly difficult time in the history of Israel. It was written after the Babylonians had completely destroyed Jerusalem. Most likely, it, it was written by the prophet Jeremiah, and it was a, uh, just a scene of complete devastation, poverty and famine that only those who have lived through war can understand. And through the book, the writer pours out his grief and his own feelings. But this morning, I want to ask, what about us? What about us as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, for whom Christ has taken our punishment and judgment that was due to us, paid the penalty for our sins, and redeemed us from slavery and broken the curse of our lives? You see, what we have in common, what I have in common, and what you have in common with the writer of Lamentations is that as believers in Jesus Christ, we will walk through difficult times. We will walk through times of changes and loss. Some of these will be relatively small. Some of them will be big. And the amazing thing about the book of Lamentations is right smack bang in the middle of this, right smack bang in it is a powerful faith and a hope-filled response to God in the midst of loss. One of the most powerful responses seen in Scripture. The writer of Lamentations gives us valuable keys to triumph over transition and to conquer change and live through any loss that we might face with faith and courage. So I'm going to read to you this morning Lamentations chapter 3 and verses 17 to 26. And the writer starts off, it starts off kind of grim, so you have to bear with me through that. He says, my soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. You know, there was a time um, through, uh, through living where we do, I went through a period of time of, of cultural adjustment. They call it cultural shock. And you can kind of have a, have a mental knowledge of that, but uh, until you've experienced it, it's hard to get a grip of. And I remember walking down the street one day about 14 months into our uh, journey in there. And, uh, and I thought, what's, what's that feeling? It's a strange feeling. What's that feeling in my heart? I thought, dear God, it's joy. I haven't felt you for a long time. <laughs> Welcome back. <laughs> and that might sound crazy, but it's true. Life was so, so grim, and there's so many challenges, that, that joy was a stranger to me. And when I revisited it about 14 months in, I'm thinking, oh, I need you. Come back. <laughs> Welcome back. So uh, it says, I've forgotten what happiness is, so I say my endurance has perished, and so is my hope from the Lord. Verse 19 he cries out, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But, everyone say, but. But this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. To conquer change and live through loss, you know what we need to do? We need to drop the denial. Drop the denial. Tell the person next to you, Drop the denial. It says, my soul is bereft of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. Throughout the book of Lamentations, the writer is so transparent, 
transparent in his own grief. Let me tell you, God's not afraid of our strong emotions. God's not afraid of them. He's not worried by them. God's secure enough to take our insecurities. And Jeremiah, he's bold in expressing them to God. But somehow in our cultures, it's considered wrong or even ungodly to even acknowledge grief or sorrow. We're expected to pretend that they they don't affect us and to lock them down deep inside of us. And I have a, a, a very vivid memory in my early 20s, my, one of my friends who, you know, he had been cast out of his home when he was, was just a kid, and he had been raised by his grandfather. His own mom and dad had said, we can't take you in our house. You need to get out. And so he was taken in by his grandfather and grandmother, and they raised him. And then in our 20s, this, uh, this, uh, my friend's grandfather died, died of cancer, and it was tough. And I, I remember, I remember being at the house, the coffin's there. And my friend is just, you know, he's, he's, he's struggling with it. And his grandmother comes up to him and says, I want to tell you, don't you dare cry. Don't you dare cry. Don't you dare show any emotion. You need to be strong for me. And as as my friend's grandfather, the only person in the world to him, his only sense of security is now dead in a box, and he's told, you keep it together. Don't you dare show any, any emotion. I was just so sad with that. But it's the way that our culture works. I also had a learned lesson in the early years of marriage that I'm fine doesn't mean I'm fine at all. (laughs) How many husbands have discovered that? They've had their wife say, I'm fine. Let me tell you, if you haven't learned that already, she's not fine, and if you don't figure it out, you're not going to be fine either. (laughs) But we're taught to do that. I'm fine, I'm all right, nothing wrong with me. Don't cry, be strong now. Where did we get these ideas from? We didn't get them from God. We didn't get them from the Bible. Now, I've always been a a big believer of saying, don't tell God about our problems. Tell our problems about God. And now there's a measure of truth in that. But let me tell you, No matter how hard we try and lock everything down inside of us and deny that it's there, no matter how hard we try to put a lid on it, it has a bad habit of escaping. It leaks out of our lives and touches our relationships around us. Unless we deal with it and express it in the right way to God, It will leak out and poison our other relationships. So in dropping the denial, we're saying, we stop pretending that it's all right. It's uncomfortable to walk through loss and hurts, to be separated from others. It's immensely hard to walk through the experiences of miscarriage or long-term sickness or the death of a family member. But the model shown for us from the Bible is clear of a full and transparent outpouring of our feelings towards God. It's clear in the life of David. You look at the Psalms. Wow, David just pours his heart out. He doesn't hold back. Now let me just put a qualification here. This is not an invitation to set up a house and live there in it. Because some people do that. It's not an invitation to set up camp around our painful experiences, pouring them out on everyone who happens to have the misfortune of meeting us. But it's simply a call to honesty and transparency with God and with trusted friends. It goes something like this. God, this really hurts. 
and I'm struggling with it. So how do we drop our denial and express our grief in a, in a he healthy way? So if I'm stuck on something, I found that I can write things down in a journal as a letter to God. It's also helpful to have friends that we can be honest with and, and to be able to talk and pray with things. Not have a bleating wine session, but just to be able to share and say, this is where I'm at. I'd, I'd be grateful if you pray with me. If you're really stuck in something, a good Christian counselor, they can help you. That's helpful. So give the person next to you a gentle nudge and say, I think he's talking about you. <laughs> you got quiet. <laughs> Is anyone with me this morning? Yeah, come on. All right. To, to conquer change and to live through loss, we need to redirect our thinking. We need to redirect our thinking. Tell the person next to you, redirect your thinking. So going on into and, uh, verses 20 and 20, 21, it says, My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. As clearly as we need to drop the denial, we need to redirect our thinking, refocus it. The prophet says, his soul continually remembers his loss. Now that's the truth that the fact is, is that when we're struggling with stuff in our lives, there's like a draw to it, a continual pull on it, and we're faced with a, with a disciplined choice of how do we walk away from that? How do, we, how do we move from it? Because our soul continually draws us that way. Recently we were looking after, my girls were looking after a friend's dog, and uh, for a few weeks while they were away, and, and this little guy, you know, he was, he was a hard case little dog, but he had a little patch of skin on his leg that was bothering him. You know what he did? He kept licking away at it until that little patch of skin became a big patch of skin that was bothering him. He was a mess, and he scratched at it and licked at it, until it became a big problem and we had to, had to uh, do something to stop him from, from, from just continually worrying away at it. He couldn't leave it alone. See, a dog that's had an operation, you know, they put a cone over its head yeah, to stop them from getting, getting at the stitches because they just can't leave it alone and they make things worse. And the human soul is just like that. It wants to pull out all of our stuff, all of our losses, all of our pains, recount them and play them over and over and over until they become bigger and bigger and bigger. That's the way the human soul works. There's a continual draw to that. But look at the result of that. If you see in the scripture, it says, my soul continually remembers it. And what happens? It is bowed down. Allowing our soul to continually replay losses results in a bowing down and a despair and hopelessness. We can't afford to let that happen. We can't let that happen. I wonder this morning, I wonder what, this, uh, what would be playing in the background of your mind this morning that might be bowing you down. I wonder what might be troubling you and is continually playing in the back of your consciousness. Why don't you take some quiet time and think about that? Find out what it is and make a decision to bring them before God and to redirect your thinking. Get some prayer if you need to. The prophet says, But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. This I call to mind. It literally means, but this I turn back to again and again. And again, it's a continual work of coming back. It's a deliberate turning away and a deliberate refocusing and turning into something else. He says again and again, I'm turning back. What's he turning back to? He's turning back to the steadfast love 
of the Lord that never ceases. His mercies never come to end. They're new every morning. And great is your faithfulness, O oh God. New every morning. The prophet's saying, what's he saying? He says, I'm putting a cone over my own head because I don't trust myself to not keep turning back to that. I'm turning myself, directing myself to the steadfast love of God that never ceases, never runs out, never comes to the end. There's times when we look at, Kalindra and I look at what goes on around us. And when we, are, when we continue to focus on that, if we continue to focus on that, it bows us down. We're asked so many times, how can you live in a place where they're selling little girls into brothels? How can you live in a place where two blocks down, you know there is a brothel being staffed by little girls who were sold by someone else, how can you live with that? And this is what we keep coming back to. In spite of what we see with our eyes, in spite of what we know what's going on, we refocus to the steadfast love of God. That never changes. That never changes. And that enables us and empowers us to continue to preach, to continue to reach out, and to continue to love in spite of all those things. See, to the Jews here, the word translated steadfast love, it had a, a whole world of meaning beyond our English translation. It means God's loving covenant faithfulness. It carries the meaning of loving kindness, mercy, goodness. In Exodus, when Moses said, God, show me your glory. Show me your glory. God hid him in the cleft of the rock and showed him his glory. What did Moses show Moses? He showed him his loving kindness, his mercy, his goodness, and his faithfulness. When we make a deliberate refocus of our lives onto the goodness of God, you know what? Something supernatural happens. Hope replaces despair. As we make a deliberate change of focus onto the overwhelming loving kindness and goodness of God, we're also changed. Hope, that positive expectation for the future, comes back into our lives. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Are there free people in this house today? Yeah, come on. Let me know. Are there free people here this morning? Come on. <laughs> and it says these free people, all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. When we make our focus, a change in our, in our direction of where our eyes are looking at, we're changed. So we worship God, we're changed. You know, that's why it's so important that we gather together it's not something that we're just, we're just coming along to sing songs. That's not it. We're coming to worship the God of all the earth, the God of heaven and earth. And as we worship him and set our eyes upon him, he changes us. He makes us more and more like him. Worship is not an, not an option, not, a, not a something that we can just pick or choose. It's a way of life that keeps us in faith, what we focus on and what we meditate on will change us. Focusing on discomfort and irritation and loss will bow us down. You know, there's a lot of things that, that we do that, uh, where we are that if I thought too hard about them, 
I would be depressed, all right? <laughs> if I thought hard about them, I would think, Doug, what on earth are you doing? Really, what do you think you're doing? You know, when you, I, I, I won't even tell you, I won't depress you with them, but uh, because, I, you know what, I choose not to think about them. I refocus because I'm more excited about the good things that God's doing than anything else. So tell the person next to you, I want to redirect my thinking. Go on. I want to redirect my thinking. Right, last point this morning. To conquer change and to live through loss, we need to wait on Him with expectancy. Wait on Him with expectancy. Lamentations to, uh, 3, 25 to 26. It says, The Lord is good to those who wait for Him. To the soul who seeks Him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Wait, seek, wait quietly. I don't know about you, but I don't like the word wait. Who likes to wait? Is there anyone here who likes to wait? I hate to wait. <laughs> I hate to wait for buses. I hate to wait for cabs or taxis. I hate to wait on the phone. Who's ever been on one of those just horrible automatic phone things? The IRD is probably the worst. You wait on that. And if you don't have a speakerphone where you can go away and have a coffee for half an hour while you're waiting for them to answer the phone, you're going to be beside yourself by the time they do pick up. I hate waiting. I hate waiting for people who are late. How about you? Is it hard to wait? Yeah. <laughs> you see, in times of change and loss, it's easy and natural to just get impatient and just want to do something. Just do anything. Waiting's boring. It feels like a waste of time. Yet there's times now waiting is exactly what we need to do. So what does it mean to wait on God? The word here carries a, a whole lot of meaning. It's not just a passive Whatever will be, whatever will, whatever will be, will be. It's not that kind of attitude. It means to look with hope and expectancy. Waiting on God with an attitude and an expectancy that God's going to do something good. If not now, any minute, God's going to do something good. That's an attitude of hope and expectancy as we wait on God. The opposite of, oh my word. You know, I, I, spoke to, uh, I spoke to someone a, a while back, and uh, you know what? After I'd finished speaking to them, I needed deliverance. I was so depressed. <laughs> I thought, oh, I couldn't, I couldn't live with being inside your skin. That guy was a pastor. I thought, I feel sorry for your people. <laughs> We need to wait on God with a sense of expectation and optimism that God is doing good things on the earth. And even if right now, right now things mightn't be so flash, I know that God is going to do something good because He's a good God. Amen. You see, to wait on God means to gather in agreement with Him. When we wait on God, it's a deliberate and determined action of putting aside our own arguments, our own hurts, our own fears and doubts and demands, and coming into agreement with Him. It means to wrap ourselves around Him. It's the same word that was used to, to make rope. If they made rope, they would twist it together and put it together together. And the rope became twisted together. So when we're talking about waiting on God, we're entwining ourselves with Him, 
wrapping our lives around him, wrapping our lives around his word. Waiting on God is about putting aside our own independence and wrapping ourselves around him. What does he say? His word and fellowshipping with his spirit, enjoying him, depending on his strength. If I could just call on the band, uh, the band this morning. I just love that song. Uh, there's a new, new sound. There's a new sound rising. I don't know what that's called, but uh, I like the sound of it. <laughs> it's strong and carries with it a spirit of faith. How many of you know what ivy is? You know what ivy, that vine? You know, we had some ivy. It's a the green vine that by itself, you know, it can only grow to about 20, 20 centimeters. But what it does is it wraps itself around something that's stronger than it, and it will grow up to 30 meters in height. Ivy wraps itself around something strong. And in waiting on God, we're called to attach ourselves to his strength. And with it, we can grow up in strength ourselves. And with waiting on God, there's a promise. How many of you know Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31? It says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God is good to those who seek him. God is good to those who seek him. God is good to you and I. You know, these are things that Kalindra and I have learned to apply in our lives. As we walk through some of the, some of the challenges and difficulties of where we live. But they also apply right here and now to you. How do we conquer this and live through this with strength and courage and faith? And be the people that God has called us to be. We do it by dropping the denial. We do it by redirecting our thinking. And we do it by waiting on Him with a sense of optimism that He's going to do something great. Both in our lives, in our family's life, in our church, in this region and even the nations of the earth. Right now, every head bowed, every head bowed, every eye closed. So what I'm talking about this morning is real. If we had to conquer change and live to be the people, be the people that God has called us to be, the first point in this is surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ. You see, without Jesus Christ, there is no hope of us standing. There is no, no hope of us conquering change. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came and He took a stand for you and I on the cross. His blood was spilled to pay our debt. And by dying on that cross, Jesus Christ paid for your sin and mine. But here's the great thing. It didn't end there. Three days later, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. And He's alive today. He's alive today. He's with us here today. Maybe you're backslidden or lukewarm, you've turned away from God. Would you take a stand for Him today? You can choose not to. You can choose to keep on living life your own way. But you need to understand that when you pass from this life, there's only one place for you. It's called hell. Or you can take a stand here today 
and surrender your life to Jesus Christ and leave this place knowing that your sins are forgiven and your debts have been paid. Your place in heaven is assured. Your debts are paid. And you've taken the first step on the road to living a life that conquers whatever may come against it. What will that be for you? If you'd like to make sure of that and want to make a stand with God today, I want you to raise your hand. Just show me this morning. Pastor, I want you to pray with me. There's one here. Anyone else this morning who wants to say, I want to receive Jesus Christ this morning. Is there anyone else in this house this morning who says, Pastor Doug, I want to receive Jesus Christ. I'm not content to live a life like this anymore. I want to receive you. Any more here this morning? One last chance. And we've got one man over here, and I'm so proud of his choice. Man, I'm so proud of you. That's a good thing. I want to pray with you this morning. It's Marlene. Marlene and Bruce, would you bring your friend up and we can pray for him. We can all pray. Would you do that for us? Would you allow me to pray for you this morning? Come on up. Come on, church. Let's give him a big clap. Come on. This is a great thing. I did this myself 25 years ago. And I will never regret this.